It's almost like clockwork at this point, where if any mildly popular new game that uses a turn-based design hits the market, there'll be a collective groan from a subset of gamers who say things like, why couldn't it have been real-time combat? Or why did they use such an obsolete game design? Or oh god, turn-based games are so boring. Look, don't try to gaslight me on this, you know it's true. While if you find something boring, there's no arguing that, honestly, and I don't have the energy to even care. I mean, that's all up to you. The other two complaints that I see a lot really don't make a lot of sense if you just scratch the surface. In fact, I'd argue that turn-based game design might offer the most opportunities for innovation going ahead. But before I get to that point, let's deal with the two most common complaints that I've heard about this style of game. To be obsolete, something needs to be either no longer necessary or it has to be replaced by something newer that does the same job but better. For all you older viewers, you already know that DVDs made VHS obsolete and cars made horses obsolete as transport. Y you know, you get the idea. Turn-based games cannot be this, however, because there's nothing to replace the unique things that are possible with this type of game design. Now, we'll get to exactly what those unique things are in a minute, but turn-based design can't be obsolete for the same reason that rock music didn't make blues obsolete or that 3D CG animation didn't make 2D animation irrelevant. Turn-based design can go in and out of fashion, sure, but it's the unique flavor that can't be replaced by anything. Chess is one of the oldest known games, and it's still incredibly popular to this day. According to the UN's article on World Chess Day, 605 million adults play chess regularly. That's more players than the copies of the COD franchise sold, much less regular active players. Chess also has effectively infinite depth. There are more possible chess games than atoms in the observable universe. That's not bad for a 64 squares of playfield. And in the card world, the biggest trading card game of all time, Magic the Gathering's biggest mode, Commander, is four players duking it out in a battle royale where each player takes their own turns, with moments in the gameplay where others at the table can respond, interact, and devise strategies with near unlimited possibilities due to the card selection. Card games in general are almost impossible to play if there isn't some form of order through turn-based design. Oh no. I'm gonna play Neheb the Eternal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he has a flick three at the beginning of my post combat. However much damage I deal, I get in red man. So now that we've gotten that taken care of, let's now talk about the unique things that turn based designs can bring to the table. Starting off, we have to go to the source of where turn based designs came from. Well, of course, our human brains. Our brains are highly parallel with almost 90 billion neurons that form trillions of connections. However, the truth is our brains aren't particularly fast. We actually can't concentrate on multiple things at once. The whole concept of multitasking is actually a myth. At best, we can switch our attention quickly between different things, but that comes at a cost. In general, the faster you have to make a decision, the less smart that decision will end up being. So when you see people perform well at split second tasks like flying a jet or or hitting a baseball, it's the result of specialized circuits that have formed in their brains through practice and repetition. When it comes to game design, this basically means that if you want complexity and depth past a certain point in your game, you're gonna have to give players enough time to think. Baldur's Gate 3 is the best recent example of this. Months ago, I started my first campaign and it was with three other friends playing co-op. Now, reading the battlefield, analyzing threats, discussing with each other a game plan, and then trying to execute on that said plan, this cycle is what honestly took up most of our playtime, especially for our party's nerdy wizard, who had to swipe through pages of spells and summons, see their range, hit chance percentage, area effect range, potential environmental effects, and current positioning against enemies. You know, that whole big brain thing. I'll save uh, my level three, my last level three to heal on here. I can give you his. I'm his natural yep. enemy. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh, he yeah, laid my ass out. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh, shit. Um, I got you, homie. Hey! I got you, homie. I'm good. <laughs> I got you, homie. We had four brains all working at the same time, and even still, each encounter required us to take our time and think. To control a party of four characters, each with dozens of powers, items and moves, and potential environmental interactions is simply impossible in real time. RPGs that try to keep a party of characters with you on the real time side of things have no choice but to take control away from you. 
In Mass Effect, you control the party leader and the AI controls the other members of your squad. While the series found ways to simplify the amount of powers and items that the player could use during combat, what never changed in the game's DNA was the power wheel. It was almost like a little piece of turn-based combat snuck its way into Mass Effect as players could freeze time in order to select specific powers they wish to use against certain enemies or order a squad mate to use one of their powers instead. The developers understood that due to the amount of mechanics and chaos that the game could produce at times, players would need a moment to analyze their current situation and figure out a solution without the fear of dying. There was also a little game called Final Fantasy XII where you could essentially use if-then statements to program your party members, but that just pushes the time and depth of turn-based play into the prepping phase of combat. And now that I think about it, it's kind of funny how now the Final Fantasy turn-based model has changed with the remake games and their action or oriented play has inarguably dumbed the combat down so that players can keep up. Now to be clear, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, but the two approaches to combat in games barely overlap in the type of satisfaction you get from each. If you think about the spectrum of things that are possible in visceral games that play out in real time, it's actually pretty narrow. Player agency is limited to movement, blocking, attacking, and using a few powers assigned to quick slots. But if you go turn-based, you can set up an infinite variety of things where your imagination is really your only limit. Of course, there are some games that are a special exception to this rule. One infamous one that I often talk about is the Dark Souls series. I have always found that Dark Souls is perhaps the most interesting way to get depth from a real-time visceral game. And years ago, I made a video discussing the psychology of difficulty in Dark Souls, which I highly recommend watching. But essentially, by making death a critical game mechanic, you can redefine the thought process of death by having the player die repeatedly and learn something new each time. Each death is its own turn, if you will. Of course, the die repeatedly design isn't going to work in every game, but it's one example I could think of where the depth closer to turn-based games becomes possible in visceral gameplay. Because it has nothing to do with technology, turn-based games aren't going anywhere. As we have clearly seen, developers are going to keep innovating in this space, making it fresh and different. Recently, I've been playing Marvel's Midnight Suns, and its card battling mechanic is a breath of fresh air, especially with the randomization of how those cards can synergize with cards of other heroes. And as a strategy nerd, nothing quite scratches the itch like a Total War game, where it weaves turn-based grand strategy on a massive world map with over a hundred different factions all vying for control with real-time massive battlefield encounters. This idea of finding ways to combine both active and turn-based systems isn't something new. Chrono Trigger's active time combat is a turn-based twist that actually stood the test of time, and for all my OGs that watched my analysis of Valkyrie Profile, if you didn't, you really should, You'll know that the game adds elements of timing to turn-based combat that is satisfying in a completely unique way. Now going back to Baldur's Gate 3, one technical feat that I found outstanding was how the developers handled real-time exploration and dialogue with turn-based combat. For instance, while one party member might be locked in a turn-based skirmish, other players who haven't been detected or engaged by the enemy can maneuver in real time. They can position themselves strategically, set up traps, or use environmental elements to their advantage. Larian Studios even went further where this was allowed even during cutscenes. This could mean anything like pickpocketing an enemy and stealing their weapon, setting up some oil slick on the ground to be ignited, or healing and buffing allies from a distance before officially entering combat. This ensures that all players are engaged and can contribute meaningfully to the battle, regardless of their character's turn order or initiative score. It's a testament to why the game was received so warmly by gamers last year. Because the developers went the extra mile and created a game that lets you test your imagination, it adds a layer of depth to the gameplay that is almost unseen in most other games, encouraging players to think creatively and use the environment and the game's mechanics in very obtuse ways. As our technology gets better, we'll see turn-based systems that are even more complex and nuanced than Baldur's Gate 3. Imagine more lifelike physics simulations or sophisticated AI. And even when we reach the point of simulating reality perfectly, turn-based designs will forever be one of the go-to tools in a game designer's kit. Now before I hit the in turn button so you can respond in the comments, I think it's funny to note that people moaning on the world's loudest turn-based platform Twitter, or X, whatever we call it nowadays, only represents a vocal minority. 
Turn-based games like Pokemon and Fire Emblem are still incredibly popular, and of course, the massive success of Baldur's Gate 3 shows that these types of games have plenty of mainstream appeal. In fact, Persona 3 Reload, which dropped recently, is beating records for most concurrent players in the franchise's history. And Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth is killing it too, a game that builds on a highly successful gamble where Like a Dragon swung from Yakuza's action gameplay to over-the-top turn-based shenanigans. So until Elon Musk puts more extra brain power in our skulls, anyone who wants to play with true strategic depth and complexity will be patiently waiting their turn to make the next move. Now that next move could be to check out my last video discussing the hate for first person perspective games, or perhaps you're more into games that are masterpieces. It's your go.